Hallelujah. A while ago, I was praying during the service, just right at the beginning, and I prayed, Lord, we need you to be here tonight. And I, I didn't even get it out of my mouth one time, and the Holy Ghost quickened into my spirit, I'm here. I'm here. And what's more, Brother Rice, is he's here all the time. He ain't gone nowhere. He ain't on break. Hallelujah. I had such a good time this morning. I thought about just preaching the same thing again tonight. But it's still good. He's still good. Hallelujah. I wish somebody would make up in their mind before I leave this place. Before I leave this place, I'm be drunk on Jesus. Before I leave this place, I'm going to manifest the fact that he's here. The scripture said this morning, always bearing about in our body the dying, giving up our will of Jesus Christ that the life also might be manifest in our mortal bodies. I wish somebody would let him cut loose in you, let him come alive in you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Is he good? Is he faithful? Is he a healer? Does he bless you? Does he bring peace into your life? Hallelujah. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 20. He's here. He's here. Acts chapter 20. I know I say it a lot, and it's just by faith, and it's just because I hope so. Now, I told you the truth this morning. I planned on being there a while, and I cut it off shorter. But tonight probably won't be that my typical long-winded sermon. And, uh, but I feel like speaking into somebody's spirit, into somebody's heart. Um, I know there are those that are not here tonight that could be here. I'm not preaching to them nor am I preaching about them. That's one of the silliest things we preachers do is preach to the people that aren't here. Huh? I know you've heard it before. We've done it. We've all done it. But I'm preaching to those that are here. The Lord laid this on me last night as I was praying for this morning, as a matter of fact. He laid it on me and... Uh, uh, I feel like it's what the Lord wants us to minister to you. It's what my spirit's saying. And then Sister Nadine loaned me a book this morning. And I just, uh, I read a several chapters in it today already. And you're probably going to be mad at her for loaning me that book. If you do, take it out on her, not on me. No. And now, Acts 20 and 22, and now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course. Everybody say, my course. my course. You know you have a course? You have a race to run? That I might finish my course with joy. Look at your neighbor and say, I want to finish. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God to testify the gospel of the grace of God. I want to preach to you for a few minutes tonight 
hopefully I can minister to you on this subject, driven by my commitment. Driven by my commitment. Pray with me right now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, you've been here in this service. We've heard some great singing. There's been a good spirit here, some good worship. But I pray, God, that you'll anoint us for just a few minutes tonight. Uh, Just for this short time tonight, let a great anointing be upon us. Uh, Lord, as we minister to the commitment of these great men and great women that make up this church body, I pray that your powerful anointing will be on me, Lord. Uh, I pray, God, that the word will go out. Uh, The word will go out and do that which it was intended to do. I pray, God, that we leave here better Christians. I pray that we leave here better men and better women. I pray, Lord, that we leave here with a renewed encouragement or a new vigor to fight the good fight of faith, to carry the torch in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Clap your hands. Clap your hands unto the Lord. All ye people. He's here. Oh, he's here. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Woo! Hallelujah. You may be seated in the name of Jesus. If you're going to preach with me and praise the Lord, give me four or five amens. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Paul has made up his mind. He is determined to go to Jerusalem. And Brother Rice, I think it's a beautiful thing that he says, I have no idea what's going to happen when I get there. I don't know what's going to happen. We don't like going places like that. It's against human nature to want to go somewhere where you don't know what might happen to you. But Paul is assured, he's assured that the Holy Ghost says there's going to be prison and there's going to be punishment because that happened everywhere Paul went. Revival broke out and the powers that be tried to shut him up. But I've told you before, read it in Fox's Book of Martyrs for yourself. They got where they had to swap Paul's guards out every three hours. Because if they didn't trade them out quick enough, he'd have them pray through to the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about being driven by a commitment. Being fueled by a testimony. Being inspired by the power of the Holy Ghost and the testimony of what he's done in your life. But this confirms his total faith in God. Total faith in God. To follow the Lord plainly with the only hint of what awaits him is that the Holy Ghost said bonds and affliction. That means they're going to shackle you and they're going to punish you for preaching the gospel. And Paul said, I'm determined to go. I'm determined to go. Paul's rationale is this. Get this, if there's going to be prison and if there's going to be punishment, then there must be some great things that the Lord has in store for us when we get there. Because if great things aren't happening, they're going to leave me alone. The the only time the devil wants to shut you up is when you're doing the work of God. If the Holy Ghost or if you feel like there may be some problems, you need to rejoice because God has got big plans for you. God's going to do a work through you you. God's got something in store. Hallelujah. Oh, if there's going to be problems, then that must mean the Lord's going to move in a mighty way. Hallelujah. Sister Nadine loaned me that book today. When I get through with it, you probably need to buy a new one. It's coming all to pieces. That's a good sign. It's the way your Bible ought to look. I read the first few chapters. Don't read it if you don't want to get under conviction. Keep on watching Hee Haw. Don't read this book because it will convict you 
One story struck me so powerful, and it's a beautiful illustration of what I'm talking about, of being driven by a commitment. A group of people went 12 miles to church one way, a foot. Brother Pete, that's walking from from here to Matthews to go to church in the morning. And one of the brethren, and if somebody says what I think you might say, I'm going to come lay hands on you. One of the brethren had pink eye. Remember reading that in there? One of the brethren had pink eyes so bad that his eyes were swelled shut. How many's had that before? Everybody knows the first rule of pink eye. But Brother Pete, he was going to church. Brother McKinney. They walked 12 miles one way to be in the house of God. I don't know who among us would do that. I'm talking about being driven by a commitment. Come on now. I'm talking about the Holy Ghost. There's something that can take place in your life that will cause you to do such as that. And this rascal had pink eyes so bad his eyes were swelled shut. I've been there before, Brother Doyle. Wake up in the morning and there'd be scale junk all over your eyeballs. You can't see nothing. So he got somebody. Grown man, Brother David. He got somebody that took him by the hand. And they led him by the hand all 12 miles to the house of God. And then they led him home because he didn't get healed. And they led him home by the hand 12 miles with his eyes swelled shut with pink eye. In this day and age, we tell him to stay home. Don't come make us contagious. God forbid that we ever tell anybody that's got a desire to be in the house of God. They can come here. If you're scared of catching a cold, you stay home. I want somebody with a great commitment. Somebody that says, I'm going to the house of God. Let me tell you something. The Holy Ghost has spoke to me this week. The Holy Ghost has spoke to me this week. You better hold on to your pews. Because there's a new chapter that's turned in this old boy's life. And it was confirmed to me by some folks that attend this church once in a while that don't even claim to live for God. But they said the reason why we come to this church is because we want to hear the truth. We want somebody to tell us when we're doing something wrong. We want somebody to lead us in the right direction. We know we're not right yet, but we don't want nobody to powder our behind and pat us on the head and tell us everything's right when it's not. tell you something. Start praying through the tabernacle. It works. I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to because I'm not scared. I came in here after I came in here Thursday morning, Wednesday night. I scratched and clawed and, and cried and belly ached my way through a Bible study. I came in here Thursday morning under conviction because I allowed the look on some people's faces, brother, Brother uh, Pete, uh, to, to discourage me. And I found myself losing my effectiveness uh, for those that are hungry because of a few folks uh, that get, get a burr under their saddle. And so I said, Lord, I need some help. When I got to the table, you hear me right now. When I, I know you may not understand it. Some of you don't understand it. Get your flyer out and start trying it. Just start trying it. You'll find as you begin to pray it, the Lord will direct you in the right path. Brother Chris, I begin to pray at the table of shoe bread, which is eating the word of God. You hear me right now. You hear me right now. Brother David, give me, I know it's not in the schedule. Give me Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse number 6, I believe it is. If it ain't right, we'll move it right down. But the Lord quickened immediately to my mind, immediately to my mind to go to this passage of Scripture. Jeremiah chapter number 1, verse number 6. Next verse. Behold, the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child. 
For thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. That ain't the best part. Look at the next verse. Be not afraid of their faces. Brother Pete, I'm walking in high cotton today because when I was in prayer, the Lord said, I am with thee to deliver thee. And if I lay something on you, you tell them what to say. I'm telling you tonight, I'm driven by a commitment to come hell or high water, I'm going to be in the house of God. I'm going to make it. I'm going to hear the trumpet sound and I'm going to hear him call my name and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter in to the joys of life. I've got my mind made up. Whoa! You tell me we don't serve a God that's mindful of us. You tell me God ain't got his hand on this church. God knows what he's doing. Revival's on the way, honey. Revival's on the way. And I'm going to keep coming. I'm going to keep coming. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling. I serve a living God. A living God. And he's here. Turn to your neighbor and say he's here. Twelve miles one way. Led by the hand by somebody else. Because he couldn't see. Oh, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't the pink eye that caused him not to see. What he really couldn't see uh, was missing church. What he really couldn't see uh, was missing out. Uh, oh, God, have mercy. You got Some of you got the wrong idea about missing church. Uh, you say, I don't want to miss church because I don't want to disappoint Brother GL. What I don't want you to do uh, or what I want you to do is start thinking, I don't want to miss church because uh, I don't want to miss Jesus. Uh, I don't want to miss out on what God has for me. Why did they want to go to church so bad? Why did they want to go to church so bad? Nobody made him go. He was driven by his commitment to God. And he was motivated by what was waiting on him when he got there. The blessings aren't there because of our sacrifice. They are there because he's able. They are there because he is wonderful. The counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, and the prince of peace. They are there because he is the bright and the morning star. They are there because they that be with us or more than they they be with them they are there because he stayed true to his calling and endured Calvary they are there because he rose from the dead and he ascended to heaven and intercedes for us they are there because he promised he promised to never leave me nor forsake me but to go with me all the way everybody say all the way he said he'd go with me, Brother David, through the good times and through the bad times. Come on. When you start praying this way and start thinking this way, you can look back down the road and see when he carried you. You can see when he carried you. But what you can never see, what you can never see is where his steps walk away from you. Never see it. That's why, Brother McKinney, I've got to stay committed to him. I've got to stay committed to him. He is going to be with me. Death, nor life, nor height, nor depth, nor angels, nor principalities can separate me from the love of God. He's never failed me. He answers my prayer. He watches over my family. He blessed me. I don't know how he did it, but in the greatest trial that my family or I have ever went through, which was losing my daddy, it ended up being a blessing. He blessed me. Many things we've endured in our lives. Some of them because of our choices. Some of them because of our commitment. But I want to stand before you and emphatically declare, I do not regret one minute in living for God. I don't regret one second. 
Brother Rice, I don't regret one service I've ever been to. I don't regret one minute in living for God. Because he ain't never done me nothing but good. Well, you hear me right now. My commitment keeps me going when I'm sick in my body. My commitment keeps me going when I'm not even sure where I'm going. My commitment speaks for me when I have no voice. My commitment. Yes, it's my commitment. I'll say it one more time. It's my commitment. When you're committed to God, you're committed to the church. When you're committed to God, you'll be committed to the pastor. When you're committed to God, you'll give your tithes even when it breaks you. When you're committed to God, you'll support everything God is doing. When you're committed to God, you'll pray. When you're committed to God, you'll fast. When you're committed to God, you'll worship. When you're committed to God, you'll sing even if you don't know all the words. When you're committed to God, you love people in spite of their faults. We must be driven by our commitment. He said, none of these other things move me. Brother Pete, we must seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then he'll add to us the other things. Paul said that I might finish my course with joy. It is a course that he has planned for me. And your course is one that he has planned for you. You just have to make a commitment to follow it. My commitment testifies of me. My commitment of the grace of God. My commitment of the grace of God. Hebrews 12 Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, that is those that have paved the way for us, those that have blazed the trail for us, those that walk to church one way 12 miles. If Brother McKinney would, he's not one to toot his own horn, but I've heard him tell of walking down the railroad dump to church with ice on the ground. How many miles? About two miles on a railroad dump with ice on the ground just to get to the house of God. That's a cloud of witnesses. You hear me right now. And I've, I've preached this before. If you remember it, just, just pretend like you didn't. That cloud of witnesses is actually a type, Brother Pete, of spectators at the starting line of a race, Brother David, that are, that are encouraging the runners. And it's that cloud of witnesses that has gone on before us that's encouraging us to let our commitment lead us. Because you hear me right now, your commitment don't get sick. Your commitment don't get weak. Your commitment, your commitment don't take a break. It's going to be my commitment that testifies of me. We are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. It's my grandma and my grandpa. It's my daddy. It's Sister Bernice. Sister Teely. Sister Crawford. Sister Hendon. Sister Adams. God rest her soul. Sister Tanner or Sister Smith as she was known to me. Sister Cardell, Brother Cardell, Brother Jones, Sister Jones, Sister Cindy Wilson, all of those that have gone before that I remember that are gathered around us as we run this race, encouraging us, pushing us. Brother Jinx, Brother Gerald Shaw, those that have gone before us. 
so great a cloud of witnesses. So let us lay aside every weight. And the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience. The race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him. Endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, which signifies power, which signifies authority, which we have. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint. In your minds. And Galatians 6 and 9 says. And let us. Not be weary. In well doing. For in due season. We shall reap. If we faint not. Does my body feel like it? Not always. Is my mind always in the right place? No. But if I keep my vision, my commitment spurs me on to the vision that God has placed before me. That is why the Bible said where there's no vision, because you've got nothing to shoot for. If we would begin to, let's stand. If we would begin to show up at the house of God, I don't mean any embarrassment to anybody. They're not even here. But I tell you what I begin to do. I begin to do as I prayed last night. I begin to envision baptizing Betty Joe in Jesus' name. I begin to envision, you hear me right now, I begin to envision LaDonna Taylor lift up her hands and begin to dance and shout in the pew right over here. I begin to envision the things that God wants to do. And I, you know what, Brother Chris? When I start thinking about those things, I want to get dressed for church the night before. I can't wait to go because he's doing great things. He's doing great things. And you know what? There's hardly nothing worse in the world than the Lord doing something great and me not get to be a part of it. So, Brother David, I got to run. I got to run with patience the race that is set before me. And when I start getting wearied and fainting in my mind, I just got to look to him. Oh, you know, you know, you hear me right now. There was a reason why they called that man to carry his cross. Because he was so weak from all the blood he shed. The ridicule, they're laughing at him up the side of that hill. He's got nothing left. But Sister Sharon, he kept going. Not because they made him, but because he had a commitment to me. To me. Because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible said, commending his love toward us. I love him. I love him. So I got to keep my commitment. Because if I look back, Brother Rice, this is just me talking. He's invested so much in me, so much mercy, so much grace. So many times he's held back. I've had car accidents when I could have got hurt really bad. I've been sick in my body and God healed me. He, he's put so much into me. I owe it to him. I owe it to him to finish my course. 
And oh, Brother David, there's no greater joy than for the finish line to be in sight. And there at the finish line stands Jehovah. Jesus Christ, God Almighty, with his hands outstretched. I'm going to see Jesus. That's why I can't give out. That's why I can't give in. That's why I can't let discouragement get the best of me. That's why I need you. That's why that I need him. That's why I need this church. Here's what I want tonight. If, you've, if you have, let me tell you something. I have been wishy-washy in my commitment before. It's miserable. It's miserable. Say, well, I don't know if you, oh, yes, you can. You can get to the place where your commitment is assured. Because from a jail cell, Brother Rice, Paul took the pen in hand and said, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. I have finished my course. I've done all I can do. Everything I can do for the king. I heard Brother Huntley preach it last summer. I'm going to leave you with this. The greatest retardant to revival. The greatest restrictive factor the apostolics have is given less than our best. Given less than our best. He deserves my best. Nobody on the face of this earth has done for me what he's done for me. And all to him I owe. So if you, if you feel like you might have been weak in your commitment and you don't want to be, if you feel like that maybe somebody, somebody wants to live for God, but because you've been weak in your commitment, they're kind of measuring themselves along with you. That's all they know to do. I want somebody to come down to this altar that's made up in their mind. I'm going all the way. I'm going all the way. I'm going to do it for the Lord. And when I do it for the Lord, then I automatically do it for the church. I automatically do it for the pastor. I automatically do it for my youth pastor, my Sunday school director. I automatically do it. It all falls in the line. It all falls in the line. These altars are open.